September 25th, 2000, Austin, Texas. 36-year-old club owner and entrepreneur Parish Patel stops by the Metro, his rock club on Austin's famous 6th Street. After picking up $15,000 from the weekend's profits, he makes his way towards Azucar, a Latin dance club he owns less than a mile away. While witnesses spot his car parked nearby, no one ever sees Parish again. Hours later, when he fails to pick up his children from school, his family notifies authorities. Austin detectives launch their investigation, quickly locating Parish's missing SUV. Discovered in a parking lot on the other side of town, they found the windows down and keys dangling from the ignition. There was no sign of Parish, nor the money he was traveling with. Years later, the leader of a Texas prison gang admits during testimony that Parish had been targeted, robbed, and murdered by the gang. However, when a federal investigation into Parish's former business partners uncovers multiple crimes, the Austin police officially announced one of them as a person of interest. Was Parish Patel the victim of a random robbery gone wrong? Had he been targeted by a violent and brutal gang or did disagreements with his business partners ultimately lead to his murder? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 204, The Disappearance of Parish Patel. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious disappearance of business owner Parish Patel. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, episode breakdowns, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or by emailing me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. 36-year-old Parish Patel had opened several successful businesses in Austin before he turned his attention to the popular nightclub scene along famous 6th Street. Along the way to the top, Parish made some enemies, so when he mysteriously vanished, investigators had their hands full. This is episode 204, The Disappearance of Parish Patel. The city of Austin is known for its colorful beauty, the splendor of historic buildings, and is often referred to as a cultural powerhouse. Noted as home to creative minds seeking artistic methods by which to express themselves and their stories, the city takes an active role in the community by providing funding for all manner of cultural attractions and public art projects. To say Austin has a little bit of something for everyone may be an understatement as each year dozens of articles are written exploring hot spots, old and new, and the reasons so many flock to the city in search of their own place in the world. It would be impossible to try and touch upon all of the fine details, unique individuals, and blended histories which make Austin the melting pot that it is. However, it doesn't take a great deal of asking around to learn all about Austin's most famous stretch of road, 6th Street, commonly referred to as Dirty Sixth. It's home to a long line of bars, clubs, restaurants, and most prominently, live music. Today, 6th Street is seen as Texas's own version of Bourbon Street, drawing in thousands of locals and visitors alike seeking an exciting place to gather with friends, share a few drinks, hit the dance floor, and throw back some food. Throughout the 80s and 90s, 6th Street exploded as the spot for live music, with major clubs popping up almost every other week. From the rock and roll thumping out from the steamboat to the reggae rhythms of the flamingo, there was a little something for everyone. While live music was considered the preeminent draw, there were also slews of dance clubs and bars that piped music through their sound systems, generating a driving beat that would fill dance floors without the need for a band on the stage. Some clubs rose to the top and earned themselves the respect and interest of the community, becoming staples in the rapidly growing and changing 6th Street scene. By the mid-90s, the area had become so popular, due in part to the massive success of South by Southwest, that the roads were closed to motor vehicle traffic Thursday through Sunday, as thousands of people jammed into 6th Street, moving like waves from club to club, bar to bar, and restaurant to restaurant. 
as one would expect, when it comes to the club and bar business in an area like 6th Street, competition can become quite contentious. Different venues battled it out, seeing who could offer the larger pay to performers and employees alike. One man who managed to claw his way to the top, at least for a period of time, was 36-year-old Parish Patel. After years of owning businesses in the Austin area, he decided to turn his attention towards the club scene. Throughout the 90s, Parish experienced a great deal of success and a few instances of failure. After the closing of his first club following a series of accusations of misconduct from the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, Parish set his sights even higher. He began setting plans into motion to open not just one club, but several of them sprinkled throughout 6th Street and the Warehouse District. By 2000, Parish was tied into six different clubs, some of which he owned others where he was a partner. Money began flowing in, and Parish reveled in his success. Opening three clubs inside of just one year, Parish was pulling in an average of $50,000 a month from cocktail sales alone. While things were going well for the entrepreneur, one does not often reach such high levels of success without making a few enemies along the way. From business partners who didn't share his views on development to competitors who argued that Parish had attempted to sink their businesses through cheap tactics, such as offering more money to steal away house bans, and even allegedly going so far as to manipulate a leaseholder into terminating an agreement, there were quite a few folks who had reason to want to see Parish lose everything. So perhaps it came as no surprise to people that knew Parish and the cutthroat nature of the business when he mysteriously vanished. It was Monday, September 25th, 2000. Following up on that weekend's business, Parish began his week as he often did, dropping by each of his clubs to see how they had done and to take cash for a bank deposit. At approximately 3.45 p.m., Parish walked out of his newest club, the Metro, carrying a wad of $15,000 in cash. Fifteen minutes later, Parish called a relative and during their conversation mentioned that he was on his way to Azucar, a Latin dance club he owned in the warehouse district. Parish was never seen again, and police would later find his vehicle abandoned in an out-of-the-way part of town. While many believed that Parish had likely been the target of a random robbery, Others theorized that the 36-year-old may have been ambushed by his own partners. Parish Patel was born on Saturday, February 29, 1964, in India. No information about Parish's childhood or upbringing has ever been publicly shared by members of his family, nor have they participated in any interviews or discussions regarding Parish. What we do know is that in the mid-70s, Parish emigrated to the United States with his family, ultimately settling in Alabama. There, Parish's family owned and operated a chain of more than a dozen motels. According to the Austin American Statesman, Parish graduated from high school in Bruton, located in Escambia County. No record searches for any high schools in the Bruton area matched up with Parish. However, there aren't a lot of records available for those schools. According to multiple Austin newspapers, Parish decided to head out on his own in the early 1980s, traveling nearly 800 miles west from Alabama to Texas, where he settled in Austin. His first business venture was far from where he would ultimately end up, when in 1983, at the age of just 19, Parish opened a dry cleaning business along Guadalupe Street, across from the University of Texas, which he of course named Longhorn Cleaners. The business was a success for Parish, and just a few years later in 1986, when he was only 22, Parish bought out his competition, Oxford Cleaners. While this marked a major change in Parish's life, at least in terms of business and his plans for growth, it would also be the beginning of legal issues which would surface and resurface throughout his life. In 1987, just a year after he purchased Oxford Cleaners, Parish was hauled into court when the former owner filed a lawsuit claiming that he owed him $69,000. Refusing to give in, Parish fought the lawsuit in court for a little over a year before the judge ruled against him. Parish agreed to pay the debt, though he would now also have to pay interest and lawyer's fees for the plaintiff with the total cost clocking in at $101,000. Four years later, in October of 1991, 
Parisha's Longhorn Cleaners became one of several businesses accused of violating trademarks owned by the University of Texas. At the time, the business utilized UT's orange and white color scheme, and all of their branding included the iconic UT Longhorn logo. Parish, along with several other business owners, had to remove the logo from their businesses, and while he agreed, he refused to repaint, covering up the orange and white. During this period of time, Parish was contacted by the Austin American statesman and gave his thoughts on the whole situation, saying, quote, Now they are saying no orange and white together. I'm going to leave the orange and white colors. They're going to have to sue me. The orange I use is not the Longhorn color. You cannot reserve the color. It's kind of stupid to me. I'll let the judge decide that. End quote. Whether it was due to all of the legal issues surrounding the dry cleaners or Parisha's own drive to be more successful and notable amongst the community, his interest would soon turn towards 6th Street and the thriving bar and nightclub scene. In March of 1992, Parish focused in on a building located at 110 Riverside Drive where he planned to open his first club. At the time, the community was concerned about these plans and worried that the club might bring a bad element into the scene. In order to appease the community, Parish met with members of the South River City Citizens Neighborhood Association. After listening to their concerns, Parish signed what has been referred to as a good neighbor agreement. Signed on March 3rd, the agreement required the club and its employees to oversee not only patrons entering the club, but also the parking lot, which in the past had been the site of underage drinking and fights, which had required the Austin police to respond. Parish agreed to keep that area under control, and following the signing of this agreement, he filed for both a mixed beverages permit as well as a late hours permit. Those applications were officially sent in to the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, or TABC, who ultimately approved. Parisha's first club, The Escape, was an 18 and up dance club which quickly drew in large crowds of adults and teens, although they didn't always mix well together. Here, Parish would experience problems from all sides. From noise complaints to other businesses claiming that underage drinking was rampant in the club, Parish mostly ignored the onslaught of negative attention as Escape continued to be a big moneymaker, successful regardless of issues. However, it was also during this time that Parish first began earning the ire of his competition. According to multiple reports, Parish went hard at everyone. He didn't seem to believe in using a great deal of diplomacy when it came to other clubs and bars, instead focusing in on trying to force them out of business through underhanded means rather than through general success alone. Danny Crooks, then the owner of the Steamboat, a popular rock club that had arrived in the mid-80s, accused Parish of targeting him. Speaking to reporters, Crooks explained, quote, I never did anything to the guy, but he seems to want me out of business. He's a hardcore guy, end quote. Crooks went on to explain that after opening Escape, Parish had tried to hire away his club's bands, offering them higher payments for their performances even while they had signed deals with Steamboat. Asked about the accusation, Parish dismissed the claims, telling reporters, quote, a lot of people are just jealous, end quote. Two years later, in November of 1994, the Escape was teetering on the edge of shutdown, while patrons continued coming in night after night and the money was flowing in a steady river straight to Parisha's hands, the attorney general's office was none too pleased with what was going on both inside and outside of the club. Between January and June of 94, the TABC cited 172 minors for possessing alcohol both in the club and in the parking lot, which Parish had agreed to manage. Parish denied the accusations saying that many of the underage drinkers were found hanging out in the parking lot of the Texas Department of Transportation, next door to his club, but there had been no proof that they had gotten their drinks from the escape. He explained, quote, We don't allow them to take the liquor out. They need to find out where the miners are getting a hold of the liquor. End quote. Regardless of Parish's claims, there were other more solid accusations which couldn't be so easily ignored. Lieutenant David Ferrero of the TABC told reporters that the problems were far more extensive and even veered into criminal acts, saying, quote, Offenses we were having inside of the club were administrative and criminal violations. 
minors drinking, some gang problems, one or two drive-by type shootings, end quote. In addition to these statements, it was also noted that Parish had been cited by the commission for filling bottles of top-shelf liquor with cheaper substitutes. Attorney General Dan Morales got involved at the insistence of the commission who brought their findings to his office. A lawsuit was filed on Wednesday, November 16th, accusing the club of failing to prevent guests from committing crimes such as assault, possessing weapons, and selling drugs. Under a 1985 public nuisance law, authorities were allowed to seek the closure of any bars or clubs where alcohol had been sold to minors. Under that law, once the suit was filed, Parish was required to pay a $10,000 bond to keep the club open, but should more legal incidents occur, a judge could order closing the business. While things were not going well for Parish's business at the time, his personal life was also in a state of conflict. Having bought a large home on Richard King Trail, 11 miles south of 6th Street, Parish would marry in the spring of 95. However, while official records list the wedding as having occurred on April 1st, it appears that issues between Parish and his in-laws had been boiling over for more than a year. The Austin American statesman reported that the Austin police had been called to Parish's home more than 16 times. Many of the calls came from Parish's father-in-law, who accused him of being physically abusive to his wife, his son, and his stepson. Detectives were never able to find evidence of abuse, nor could they prove any of the accusations levied against Parish. However, in May of 1995, police were called to the house, and this time, Parish was arrested. Neighbors called to report a fight at the home, and when police arrived, they found a troubling scene. Reportedly, during an argument with his father-in-law, Parish grabbed a baseball bat and threatened to beat him with it. During the scuffle, Parish's wife got in between the men and was accidentally struck with the bat. In response, Parish dropped the bat and ran into the kitchen, returning with a large butcher knife. He continued to issue threats to his father-in-law, telling him to get out. Ultimately, Parish would throw the knife at his father-in-law, stabbing him through the foot. Parish was arrested and charged with aggravated assault. The case would be presented to a grand jury who indicted him on felony charges. However, prosecutors dropped the case after Parish's father-in-law asked them to, saying he had no intentions of sending his son-in-law to prison. Parish and his wife would later separate and divorce, with her moving out of the Richard King Trail home. Back at the escape club, things weren't going well either. Despite having paid the $10,000 bond following the lawsuit from the Attorney General's office, police were continuing to respond to calls of violence, drug sales, and underage drinking. Finally, the TABC petitioned to have the club's liquor license revoked, and upon succeeding, this essentially killed the night spot as without the ability to sell liquor, many of the patrons would find new places to go. For the next few years, Parish kept himself out of the spotlight. He partnered with other club owners and continued earning money, trying to keep his finger on the pulse of 6th Street. He was in the midst of rebuilding his image, wanting to cast aside memories of his legal troubles and his first club's failures. Parish saw himself as a prominent member of the Austin community, as well as a key name in local business. He started networking with other business owners, different community associations, and the local population. He had a bigger vision for 6th Street, and he wanted to be the one at the head of seeing the 6th Street area change. Around this same time, Parish began requesting that others call him Paris, which is how I'll refer to him from now on in this episode. For as much as Paris put into rejuvenating his image, though, legal issues continued to surface, derailing his plans. In 1998, Paris was once again sitting behind the defendant's table in court when the Del Valle School District and Rural Fire Department filed a joint lawsuit against him for unpaid property taxes. Reportedly, Paris hadn't paid upwards of $11,000 owed to the county, and despite records proving this, he decided to fight the lawsuit. After what can only be termed a short trial, a judge found Paris guilty and ordered that he pay the money owned or his house would be auctioned off. Just days before the home was set to go up for auction, Paris made the payments. While 1998 hadn't gone so well for Paris, 1999 would be a banner year for the club owner who would go on to open three new clubs. He purchased a club formerly known as The Spot on Lavaca Street in the Warehouse District 
and reformed it as a Latin dance club named Azucar. Then came Malagio, which replaced the former Wiley's at 400 East 6th Street. Malagio was a smaller venue, considered to be a more sophisticated dance club, which drew in high rollers who danced and sipped martinis at the club's elevated bar. The third and final club opened by Paris was the Metro, a rock club which took the place of the former Mercury. Paris was the owner of the club, though he opened it with a partner, Josh Cisneros. The Metro was set to be Paris's next big thing, and while its arrival was lauded by critics who even went so far as to compliment Paris for bringing in a higher brow crowd, there were those who weren't pleased to see him succeeding and others who outright blamed Paris for their own club's failures. As previously mentioned, Danny Crooks, the former owner of the steamboat, held bad blood towards Paris, believing that he had helped undermine his lease, causing him to lose the club that he'd had for 23 years. The steamboat closed its doors in 1999. Around this same time, other club owners in the area were reportedly visited by Paris when their numbers were down. According to those who knew Paris, he frequently would drop in at failing clubs just to taunt the owners about his own success. Josh Cisneros acknowledged this aspect of his business partner, telling the statesman, quote, you'd see him smirking in every club. No one likes him, but he's successful. With us, it was good cop, bad cop. Paris was the bad cop, end quote. Due to his strong business acumen and hard-nosed style of taking on the competition and going out of his way to crush them, the media dubbed Paris as the Jerry Jones of Sixth Street. Now, I should note, Things have changed quite a bit in the past 22 years, and while today being referred to as the Jerry Jones of anything would be received as an insult, back in 2000, this was high praise comparing Paris to the then respected and highly successful owner, president, and general manager of the Dallas Cowboys. Even competitors who didn't like Paris had to admit he had a way of making it work with his clubs, and his clubs were some of the hottest on 6th Street. In the midst of all of this new success with his public image masterfully cleaned up, there would of course come another legal situation that would smear dirt on Paris's reputation. In July of 1999, the Texas Attorney General's office filed a child support lien against him. Apparently, six years earlier, Paris had fathered a daughter with an unnamed woman. Paris hadn't been making his required child support payments, so he was taken to court where it was stated that he owed approximately $20,000. On September 15th, just 10 days before Paris mysteriously vanished, the judge ordered that he would pay an additional $200 a month on top of his already set $300 child support payments. This extra amount would remain in play until Paris managed to pay off the $20,000. This case surprised friends and neighbors who saw Paris as a genuinely good guy who cared deeply for his family. At the time, he was living in his five-bedroom home on Richard King Trail with his son and stepson. Jim Hochstetler, a neighbor, explained to reporters that as far as he knew, Paris was a doting father and devoted neighbor. He explained, quote, He's a good father, without a doubt. When I call him, he'd be right over. He was a good neighbor. No doubt about that, end quote. In the days leading up to his disappearance, Paris hired a crew of workers who were tasked with constructing a large backyard playhouse for his kids. The playhouse would be carpeted, heated, and have a set of bunk beds inside. Local papers reported on Paris describing him as a man of contradictions, a doting father who wasn't paying child support a successful club owner who frequently went to court for not making payments to business owners and the county, a guy who spent a large amount of his time in bars and clubs where the liquor flowed heavy, yet no one had ever seen him take a sip, a powerful businessman and entrepreneur who took shortcuts and tried to cut the legs out from under his competition. To some, Paris was a good, hardworking man who colored inside the lines, while to others, he was simply the devil incarnate. By September of 2000, Paris was 36 years old and sitting atop a growing empire of clubs and bars. Outside of his three ventures with Azucar, Malagio, and the Metro, he was also tied into a handful of other venues. 
The Yassin family were developing their own club empire in Austin under the banner of their company, Yassin Enterprises. How or when the Yassin family, run predominantly by brothers Hussein Ali, known commonly as Mike, Muhammad Ali, known as Steve, and Hadi. Paris had become a business partner with the Yassins, being involved in their clubs Platinum X, Chrome, and Treasure Island. Curiously, though, there seemed to be somewhat of a debate about who exactly owned what. While Paris stated that Azucar, Malagio, and the Metro were his, the Yassins told the media that they were also co-owners of those three clubs. When the Austin American Statesman ran a featured series about venues on 6th Street, they asked Paris about the Yassin's ownership in his clubs. Paris replied, quote, Whatever Mike and Hattie say is theirs, go along with it. We have, like, a family deal. End quote. Josh Cisneros, who ran the Metro with Paris, was also asked about the Yassin's claims and stated, quote, It's just Paris and I. Mike and Hattie are great guys, but sometimes they get a little ahead of themselves. End quote. Having grown his own personal club empire, Paris was asked if he had any plans for new clubs, bars, or any other businesses along 6th Street. He told reporters, quote, We like the challenge of opening clubs and bringing in new things. We want to be the best and keep the Austin club scene fresh. We've only just started. End quote. Just four days after the article was published, Paris disappeared. Monday, September 25th, began as any normal day did for Paris. The life of a club owner is typically a busy one, requiring long nights and late mornings. Being that it was Monday, Paris was planning on conducting his normal post-weekend routine, which would involve stopping by all of his clubs, finding out how much the weekend had made, looking over the books, and then gathering up cash to deposit at the bank. We don't know exactly what Paris had done for the beginning of his day, but by 3.30 that afternoon, he was making his way to 6th Street. Paris's first stop was the Metro at 505 East 6th Street. According to his partner, Josh Cisneros, upon arriving at the club, the two had a short conversation about the previous weekend. Opening the safe, Paris took a stack of cash totaling $15,000 to deposit in the bank. According to Cisneros, Paris did not conceal or secure the money and even stood outside having a conversation with someone all the while holding that cash in his hand. Paris was planning to make his next stop at Azucar, located less than a mile west at the corner of Lavaca and 4th Street. This was later confirmed by investigators who noted that after climbing into his white Lexus SUV, Paris made a call to a relative and said that he would be stopping by Azucar to pick up the deposit before he went to pick up his kids from school. What exactly happened after Paris got off the phone has never been determined, but when the 36-year-old never showed up at school to get his kids, those who knew him well believed something terrible had to have happened. Several hours later, after repeated calls to Paris went unanswered and no one could recall seeing him after 4 p.m., his family contacted the Austin police and filed a missing persons report. Considering Paris's high-profile name and the countless members of the community who knew him or worked with him, detectives initially believed it would be a short investigation. After taking the report, detectives had a lot to work with. There were friends, neighbors, business associates, and a long list of competitors and enemies. Knowing that the last time anyone officially saw Paris was outside of the metro, detectives went to the club to interview the staff and Paris's business partner. Had anyone been making threats? Was there anyone Paris expressed fear or concern about? As it turned out, no one seemed to have any guess as to anyone who might have been behind the disappearance. Cisneros was deeply concerned. It was unlike Paris to just go off without telling anyone, but not picking up his kids was a bad sign. Cisneros explained, quote, Everyone is wondering where he is. He didn't pick his kids up from school like he normally does, and that's kind of scary. We're really freaking over here, end quote. At the time, detectives brought up the possibility that maybe Paris had decided to take the money and run. He had recently had the child support lien placed against him. His clubs were still being closely monitored by the TABC, and investigators thought he might have decided to get out of Texas, perhaps even the United States, to get away from all of the trouble. To Cisneros, though, 
this was quickly dismissed as $15,000 was a drop in the bucket compared to the money Paris had access to. Speaking with the Austin American statesman, he explained, quote, he has a lot more money than that. No matter what anybody says about Paris, they couldn't say he wasn't a genuinely devoted father. That's how we knew this was for real from the start, end quote. Finding no new information at the Metro, detectives turned their attention towards Paris's next destination, Azucar. Making the short drive west, detectives arrived at the club where they spoke with Rene Adam, with whom Paris co-owned the club. What exactly Adam said to investigators is unclear, as the Austin police have been exceedingly tight-lipped about this case. However, detectives did reveal that they had found several witnesses who had seen Paris's Lexus SUV parked at the corner of Lavaca and 4th Street. This would suggest that, at a minimum, Paris made it to Azucar, but where he had gone from there, no one knew. While they had witnesses who had seen the car parked near the club, those witness accounts concluded at approximately 7 p.m., at which time no one recalls seeing the SUV again. It seemed apparent to investigators that had Paris planned to pick up a cash deposit before getting his kids from school, that shouldn't have taken very long. At that point, detectives were trying to determine whether Paris had run into foul play before he could make it back to his car or if he had been the one to drive it away. They would eventually get an answer, partially, just a few hours later. Approximately five miles north of Azucar along Airport Boulevard, police came across the abandoned white Lexus SUV. The exact location that the vehicle was found in has never been revealed, though investigators did state that it was discovered in a parking lot. According to detectives, at the time the vehicle was found, all of the windows were down and the keys were dangling from the ignition. They theorized that whoever had left the SUV there had left it unsecured in hopes that someone might steal it, lending further confusion to the investigation. Again, investigators were very precise about what details they would and would not release. They never revealed what evidence may have been found in the car, only noting that any evidence they did collect had been sent to the Texas Department of Public Safety's crime lab. Unfortunately, they didn't have a lot of evidence to work with, and what was initially thought to be a quick investigation was clearly going to provide a greater challenge. Theories about Paris leaving of his own volition were quickly building up steam, but after the finding of the vehicle, detectives no longer thought this was a possibility. Asked about this, Austin Police Commander Dwayne McNeil told reporters, quote, we do not think he left of his own accord, end quote. Unfortunately, the search for Paris was predominantly fruitless for the Austin Police, who received a large number of tips that in the end led nowhere. In hopes of generating more information, it was announced that Paris's family was offering a reward of $10,000 for information leading to his return or the arrest of anyone involved. While this reward was reported all across the media, it failed to stir up anything for investigators. And by October of 2000, Paris's case was already growing cold. One month later in November, Paris's family put his Richard King Trail home on the market, selling it for $265,000. There had been little to no movement in the investigation up to this point, and the possibility that Paris would be found safe was quickly fading from the minds of friends, family, and investigators. Early on in December, more than two and a half months after Paris vanished, the Austin police announced they were officially transferring his case from missing persons to robbery homicide. Asked about this, detectives had little to say other than the fact that they had reason to believe that Paris was dead. Back on 6th Street, without Paris there to keep things moving along smoothly, his three clubs were all beginning to suffer. Josh Cisneros, co-owner of the Metro, told the Austin American statesman that he was determined to keep the business afloat, though he readily acknowledged it would be a lot easier if Paris were there asked his thoughts about what might have happened to his business partner, Cisnero stated his belief that Paris had likely been targeted for robbery and something must have gone wrong. Cisneros noted that Paris had picked up $15,000 that afternoon and likely had even more money in his SUV. Since club owners generally make their deposits on Mondays, Cisneros thought someone familiar with Paris may have known his schedule 
and set up an ambush. The year 2000 would come to an end with no further developments, nor any solid statements from investigators about what they believed happened, any evidence they'd recovered, or any potential persons of interest. Seven months later, in July of 2001, it was reported that the Austin police had investigated 703 missing persons cases the previous year. Only one of the adults on that list was still missing, and it was Paris Patel. Asked about progress on the case, Commander McNeil replied, quote, There are no developments other than to say Patel is missing, end quote. In January of 2002, it was announced that both the Metro and Azucar were going to be losing their liquor licenses. During the process of the investigation into Paris's disappearance, it was discovered that while he was officially listed as the owner of the clubs, Paris's name was not the one on the liquor licenses. Instead, that name was Rene Adam, his partner in Azucar. Lieutenant David Ferrero of the TABC stated that the clubs were scheduled to be shut down due to this particular subterfuge. Apparently, after losing his first club, The Escape, due in part to underage drinking, Paris wasn't able to properly obtain a liquor license in his own name. The next month, in February, both clubs were officially shut down. As Paris's presence began fading from 6th Street, so did media coverage of his disappearance. Soon, the case was cold, and days turned to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years. In February of 2004, Paris's name exploded back into the headlines in a way no one had expected. The federal government was prosecuting a case against members of the Texas Syndicate, a prison gang that had been involved in drug running, murder, and money laundering, among other crimes. Three members of the gang were ultimately charged with racketeering conspiracy due in part to the testimony of Randy Salazar, the leader of the gang. At the time, prosecutors were arguing to connect the syndicate to a series of four unsolved homicides in Central Texas, though during cross-examination, Salazar mentioned a fifth. Larry Dowling, a defense attorney, was questioning Salazar about the Central Texas victims when suddenly he asked him about the guy underneath the HEB over in Buda. Trial transcripts show that Salazar answered saying, quote, I don't know his name, but I know he's Iranian. He owns some clubs on 6th Street, end quote. While Paris was definitely not Iranian, the other details certainly caught the attention of investigators who, for the previous three years, had hit nothing but dead ends in their search for Paris. FBI Special Agent Stephen House confirmed to the statesman that Salazar was absolutely talking about Paris Patel. As for further comment, House wouldn't go into the details, although it was noted that Randy Salazar was in prison at the time of Paris's disappearance. Larry Dowling asked about this after the testimony, told reporters that Special Agent House had interviewed Salazar before the trial. Reportedly, hoping to get himself a plea deal to avoid a heavier sentence, Salazar told House that several people had been involved in the robbery and murder of Paris, though neither Dowling nor the FBI would offer additional comments. Sergeant Hector Reveles, assigned to Paris's case, was asked whether or not the Austin PD were aware of these allegations or if their investigation had previously led them towards members of the Texas Syndicate. Revelis, answering coyly, told the media, quote, We also have other leads that are equally, if not more, promising. End quote. Revelez would not offer up any additional details, though when asked what he believed happened to Paris, Revelez replied, quote, There is every reason to believe that he is deceased and no reason to believe that he may still be alive, end quote. Salazar alleged that Paris had been killed and murdered with his body being buried at a construction site in the city of Buda, approximately 14 miles south along I-35 from 6th Street. Interestingly, an HEB store was being built around the time of Paris's disappearance, though the company didn't believe it was possible that his remains could have been concealed at their site. Kate Rogers, a spokesperson for HEB, explained, quote, Just from a sheer timeline perspective, it's unlikely that Patel could have been buried there. By that time, clearly the foundation would have been poured. We were hiring by that time. End quote. According to Rogers, 
The construction crew had broken ground on the site in May of 2000, and the store opened on December 13th, which meant that when Paris vanished on September 25th, the store was well along in its construction. The foundation was already there, and they didn't have any open areas where someone could have dug beneath the site to place a body. While this particular trial had managed to reveal new information about what may have happened to Paris, nothing much was being done about it. Reportedly, Austin investigators had already heard this story about him being buried beneath the grocery store, but they didn't buy it. They never went down to the store or spoke to the company about conducting any digs or utilizing cadaver dogs on the property. Eight long years would pass before there were any new developments, but when they hit, they sent a shockwave rippling down 6th Street that would echo for years to come. On Thursday, March 22nd, 2012, 10 people linked to Yasin Enterprises were arrested and charged with multiple crimes, including distributing cocaine, transferring firearms used to commit drug trafficking, and money laundering. Among those arrested were Hussein, known as Mike, his brothers Hattie and Mohammed, known as Steve, their assistant Maurice Ruales, and six others. These arrests came following an investigation which had been ongoing since 2007. Ruales and the three brothers were charged with money laundering, according to court documents. In addition, Steve was also accused of distributing more than 500 grams or more of cocaine and transferring a firearm knowing it was going to be used for drug trafficking. The U.S. Attorney General's office issued a statement at the time of the arrests, saying, in part, quote, Authorities believe that they use several business establishments located in downtown Austin to launder over $200,000 in cash, which they believe to be proceeds of narcotic trafficking, end quote. A number of agencies were involved in the investigation, including the FBI, IRS, and DEA, as well as the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, state comptrollers, the Attorney General's Office, and the Austin Police. On Tuesday, March 27th, prosecutors laid out their case against the Yassine brothers, claiming that while they led flashy lifestyles with expensive cars, millions in real estate and clubs, the money didn't quite add up. In addition to previously mentioned charges, the prosecution argued that the Yassines may have had financial ties to Hezbollah, defined by the United States as a terrorist organization. Fred Burton, a counterterrorism expert, said the investigation went far deeper than it appeared, telling KVUE News, quote, This will be following the money trail, following the uncle into Lebanon. Who is this man? What role does he play within the Hezbollah organization? What was he doing with the money in Lebanon? There's going to be an intelligence case on top of this that's going to be highly classified, end quote. IRS criminal investigator James Neff testified that the Yassines definitely had ties to Hezbollah, saying that the link came in the form of a cashier's check totaling $45,000 made out to a member of the Yassine family in Lebanon. The unnamed relative, reportedly an uncle, was associated with the terrorist group at the time and the money was tracked from the Yassines in Texas to the uncle. One day later, on Wednesday, March 28th, the Austin Police Department issued a press release stating that Hussein Ali Mike Yassin was officially being called a person of interest in Paris's disappearance. According to investigators, they discovered that Paris had a disagreement with Yassin Enterprises around the time he vanished, which also happened to be just four days after he denied that the Yassins had any ownership in his three clubs. Perhaps what makes the link to the Yassin brothers stronger than it initially appeared stemmed from the fact that Alejandro Melendrez, a member of Yassin Enterprises, who was also arrested and charged, had direct ties to the Texas Syndicate prison gang, the one former leader Randy Salazar claimed had killed Paris and buried him beneath the construction site. Melendrez denied at a hearing that he had any connections to the Texas Syndicate, but an investigator testified that Melendrez sold cocaine at one of the Yassin's nightclubs to an undercover FBI informant and allegedly threatened to kill him if he talked to the police. According to the investigator, their case had discovered and defined distinct links between Melendrez and the syndicate. Asked his thoughts about these developments, Josh Cisneros was caught off guard. 
While he admitted he could believe the Texas syndicate may have been involved in Paris' disappearance, he struggled to accept that any of the Yassines could have been in on it, especially Mike. Cisneros explained, quote, They were friends. Those guys were going on vacations together every week. They hung out a lot back in the day. If he is linked to Paris, it would be more shocking than anything that has been said so far. End quote. Two weeks later in April, more details about charges against the Yassines and members of their company were released. Investigators stated that they had both audio and video recordings of several of the defendants selling drugs to their informant. According to Randy Gillette, a DEA agent involved in the case, Steve Yassine bought drugs from this informant and then introduced him to Nizar Hakiki, who also went on to sell the informant pistols to be used for protection during drug deals. The informant, alongside Steve, also purchased a kilo of cocaine from Kareem Faik for $24,000. Allegedly, this deal occurred outside of Steve's house in a taxi cab driven by Faik. The middle Yassine brother, Hattie, ran the famous vodka beverage company. Prosecutors argued that in at least one instance that they could prove, $100,000 in drug money was pumped into the company. Mike Yassine apparently told the FBI informant that he wanted to launder $200,000 to $1 million in drug money through the nightclubs and other businesses. The informant also purchased a large amount of drugs from Alejandro Melendrez. While the Austin police did list Mike Yassine as a person of interest in Paris' disappearance, no charges related to Paris were ever levied against him or any other members of the family. In fact, when the Yassines finally did go to trial, they weren't charged with anything connected to Paris nor Hezbollah, and all of their charges were for money laundering, and in Mike's case, drug trafficking. In October of 2012, nearly seven months after the Yassines' arrests, Austin cold case homicide investigator Angel Hernandez was asked about new developments in Paris's case. Hernandez was quick to dismiss the belief that they'd broken the case open saying they'd hoped more information would have come out during the trial that could help them. Hernandez explained, quote, it really hasn't moved all that much, end quote. At the conclusion of their trials, there were no charges or links between any of the defendants in Paris. Mike Yassine received the longest sentence of the bunch, 12 and a half years for cocaine distribution and money laundering. He also had three years tacked on for tax evasion. His brothers, Hattie and Steve, received five-year and one-year sentences, after which they were deported to the Ivory Coast. According to prosecutors, the entire case was built on flipping one of the Yassine's cousins, often referred to as Mo. In 2007, Mo was approached by federal investigators who began paying him $4,000 a month to operate as an informant for them, which he did for the next five years. While the charges against the Yassines and their associates were completed in the end, despite all of the revelations, the status of Paris's disappearance remained the same. Ten years have passed since the Yassines' trials concluded, and not one word about Paris or his fate has been uttered by investigators or anyone in the media. When last seen, Parish Patel was described as being an Asian male with brown hair and eyes, standing 5 feet 9 inches tall and weighing approximately 135 pounds. According to witnesses, Parish was last seen wearing a blue long sleeve shirt, a black Guess brand jacket, black jeans, and a baseball cap. He was last confirmed to have been leaving the metro at 505 East 6th Street en route to Azucar, less than a mile away, at 400 Lavaca Street. His vehicle, a white Lexus SUV, was spotted parked at Lavaca and 4th Street as late as 7 p.m. on Monday, September 25th. It was located the next day, five miles away in a parking lot off Airport Boulevard in East Austin. At the time of his disappearance, Harris was 36 years old, and if alive today, he would be 58. Next week will mark 22 years that Parish Patel has been missing. Over the past two decades, much has changed in Austin. New buildings go up, old ones come down. New businesses open and old ones close. The cycle that Paris spent so much of his life involved in has never stopped. 
but the search for answers has at least been stifled. Between statements from Randy Salazar and accusations made by prosecutors against the Yassine family, many who knew Paris remain frustrated and surprised that even 22 years later, no one has ever been charged and Paris has never been found. One thing they are sure of, however, is that the answers are out there somewhere, if only those who knew the truth could be moved to speak up. There haven't been a ton of theories or debates about what happened to Paris that Monday afternoon in September of 2000. Strangely, this is a case which, despite potential connections to a prison gang and a family that ran an empire of clubs, drugs, and guns, it's exceedingly difficult to find a whole lot of information about the investigation, the disappearance of Paris himself, or anything in between. In the end, there have never been solid answers given as to whether investigators, local or federal, had any conversations with Randy Salazar or any of the Yassine brothers regarding Paris's fate and what may have been learned if they did. So when you give this case the 10,000-foot overview, there are three primary theories that have been put forward, some of them directly from the Austin police and or federal prosecutors. Initially, the belief was that Paris had to have been the victim of a robbery gone wrong. Given his tendency to pick up money from his clubs every Monday around the same time, before heading to the bank to make deposits, many thought it was possible that someone had been tracking his movements and planning out the robbery. This, of course, could have been people who knew Paris, but it also could have been completely random, just targeting someone they know has money. We know that Paris left the Metro with $15,000 in cash, though Josh Cisneros suggests there was a likelihood that there was more money in the SUV. From there, he was set to make a short two-minute drive west to the corner of Lavaca and 4th Street so he could collect money from Azucar. Witnesses reported seeing the SUV parked on the corner, though apparently no one actually saw Paris. This led many to wonder if perhaps the assailants were waiting nearby to ambush Paris. Perhaps as he walked towards the club, he was forced into a vehicle, or maybe they waited until he'd gone in, grabbed cash, and was making his way out to make the robbery more lucrative. Strangely, investigators have never said if Paris made it into the club that afternoon or if any cash had been removed from the business. Once the suspect or suspects had Paris in their custody, it becomes one of those frustrating situations where almost anything is possible. It seems, given that Paris has never resurfaced, that he didn't survive the robbery. More than likely, before even robbing him, the assailants would have planned to kill him. It wouldn't make sense to leave a witness alive, especially one who would have spent enough time with them to possibly identify them. Beyond that, if someone who knew Paris was involved, he'd not have had any trouble telling police who it was. The only other solid piece of information we really have in this case, at least in terms of evidence, comes a few hours after the disappearance when the Austin police find Paris's SUV abandoned in a parking lot along Airport Boulevard in East Austin, approximately five miles northeast of Azucar. For reasons passing understanding, investigators have never revealed exactly where the car was found, nor what evidence, if any, was recovered from the vehicle. Multiple articles speculate as to the actual location where the SUV was found, wondering if perhaps revealing the specific site might suggest a connection to a person of interest. Either way, once they got the car, the Austin police essentially went quiet. Three months later in December, they officially transfer the case from missing persons to robbery homicide and make public statements about their belief that Paris is dead. Whether or not that belief is based on any hard evidence or is the natural conclusion to a missing persons case where no trace of the victim can be found is unknown. All we can really say for sure is that investigators believed Paris had been killed, though whether or not they had anyone in mind who may have been involved, at least early on in the case, has also never been revealed. So sure, it's entirely possible that Paris could have been targeted for robbery, either by people he knew or complete strangers. Given his notorious history on 6th Street to say there's a long line of people who wanted to see something bad happen to Paris would be a massive understatement. Other business owners held grudges and felt Paris had tried to ruin them. Former employees complained of being underpaid and treated badly. Even his own business partner, Justice Narrows, acknowledged that no one really liked Paris, at least not on 6th Street, and that when it came down to running the business, Paris excelled at playing the role of a bad cop. 
Let's turn our attention now towards the other two theories, which in a way are somewhat of the same theory. We begin with Randy Salazar, former leader of the Texas Syndicate, a prison gang with ties to murder, drug trafficking, money laundering, and a slew of other crimes. Salazar, along with other members of the gang, were going to court over charges that they'd been involved in the murders of four people from Central Texas. Prior to trial, Salazar met with the prosecution and federal agents, at which time he worked at a deal, whereby he would testify against the other members of the gang. When he took the stand, his lawyer asked him about the man buried beneath the grocery store in Buda. While Salazar never said the name Paris Patel, he did refer to a man who owned several clubs on 6th Street who was Iranian. Obviously not the sharpest tool in the shed, Paris was Indian, Federal agents did confirm that the man he was speaking about was Paris Patel. The grocery store in the discussion was an HEB that was built in Buda between May and December of 2000, right during the period that Paris disappeared. Curiously, while we have this information, nothing additional was given to explain why Paris had been killed. Did the gang target him for reasons of their own, or did they act at the behest of another? We'll get into the latter part of that question a little later when we get into the third theory. For their part, HEB argued that it was unlikely this could have happened. Construction on the store began in May, and Paris vanished on September 25th. According to HEB, the foundation had already been laid by that time, and they were in the process of hiring on employees. To them, it seemed, there was no way that they could have buried Paris beneath the store at that point in time. In the years that have passed, though, many have brought up other possibilities. If the store foundation had been laid, what about the parking lot? There's a lot of space around the grocery store, and the parking lot's expansive. It certainly wouldn't have been difficult to bury Paris there, only for the construction crew to pave over that spot later. Now, a spokesperson for HEB said that the Austin police had not contacted them or made any request to examine the property or do any digging. It appeared at the time that while investigators believed the syndicates could certainly have been involved in the crime, they didn't think it all came to an end at the grocery store. When asked about this, one investigator told the media that they were aware of the theory, but they had other, more promising theories. Being that this case has gone unsolved for more than two decades, I'm not sure what those promising theories were, but clearly they never paid off. When you look at a timetable, it's possible. All in all, to grab Paris from Azucar, take him south to Buda, and then drive his vehicle north to Airport Boulevard was, in total, a 30-mile trip. Depending upon where they may have taken Paris after abducting and robbing him, they could have easily robbed him, killed him, and disposed of his body inside of an hour's time. If more than one person was involved, which seems to be the case, that time would have been even faster as while someone was disposing of the body, another person could have been abandoning the car. Now, the Texas Syndicate doesn't exactly need a reason for any of the crimes they've committed. Perhaps they were aware of Paris, knew he had money, and saw him as an easy target. But when you consider there were accusations that drugs were being trafficked through some of his clubs, it's not out of line to think that some of that drug running could have been tied to the gang, and maybe there was a problem there. But there is yet another theory which adds on to the Salazar account. In early 2012, 10 members of Yassin Enterprises were arrested and hit with a slew of charges related to drug trafficking, illegal firearm sales, and money laundering. After the arrest of the three Yassin brothers and seven of their associates, the Austin police suddenly made the announcement that Hussein Ali Yassin, known as Mike, was a person of interest in Paris's disappearance. When asked for additional information, detectives stated that through the course of their investigation, they discovered that Paris and the Yassines had had a business disagreement in the days leading up to his disappearance. The exact details of this disappearance have never been released, but some who worked with Paris and others who worked with the Yassines have gone on to speculate that it may have been in reference to the series of articles the Austin American Statesman had published about the clubs on 6th Street. While the Yassines claimed co-ownership of Paris's three clubs, he denied that they were involved with them. Co-owner of the Metro, Joss Cisneros, gave similar statements, noting that while the Yassines were good guys, they often got ahead of themselves, and at that point, only he and Paris were running the Metro. Curiously, though, for all of the times Paris appeared in the media, he always came across as a cocky, driven, hard-nosed businessman who had big plans for the future. But when he got asked about the Yassines, 
It's one of the only examples of a time where Paris didn't play the businessman card. Paris doesn't say, no, they're not involved. He doesn't say, I work with them in other clubs, but these three are mine. Instead, he makes the weird comment that you should just always go along with whatever the Yassin say, adding, quote, we have like a family deal, end quote. What exactly that means, no one knows, but it sounds like Paris is trying to say the Yassins aren't involved in his clubs, but without offending them or pushing the issue too hard. It's a fairly straightforward question. Are the Yassins co-owners? Why did Paris struggle to give a direct answer, something he's never had a problem with in the past? Some would say because Paris was smart and he knew what people could be ignored and what people should be feared. The biggest link between the Yassins and Paris's disappearance comes in the form of Alejandro Melendrez. According to the Austin police as well as the FBI, Melendrez had direct connections to the Texas syndicate. While Melendrez denied this, prosecutors felt confident in their belief and moved forward with the case. If indeed Melendrez is tied to the syndicate, it isn't difficult to imagine that when someone got out of line, they may have turned to the gang to handle it. So we come back to the question I asked earlier. Did the syndicate move on their own, or had they been asked and likely paid to get involved? If that's how it went down, it's not hard to understand why Paris has never been found. You'd have the Yassines, who could not only give intricate details about Paris, his vehicle, and his routines, but they were also in a position where they could arrange a meeting with Paris, and he wouldn't have a reason to be suspicious of it. While we have no way of knowing for certain what happened, many believe that when Paris arrived at Azucar that afternoon, someone he considered a friend may have walked him right into the waiting arms of the Texas syndicate. There could be a lot of different reasons why. Paris was a hard-driving businessman, and maybe he didn't think that Yassine should get any money out of his clubs. They were heavily involved in drug and gun trafficking, and maybe Paris didn't want to be around it or threatened to notify authorities should they threaten his business. It certainly could have been a complex situation, or... It could have been as easy as Paris saying the wrong thing to a guy who was shoveling cocaine up his nose. Mix in the paranoia associated with prolonged cocaine abuse, and if you're running a criminal empire as the Yassines certainly were, maybe you think it's better to be safe than sorry. In the end, I think a lot of the frustration with this case comes out of the fact that multiple agencies reported that the Yassines were likely involved in Paris's disappearance, and then they never followed up on it. Much like the accusations of the brothers sending money to the terror group Hezbollah, there were never any charges. None of the Yassines nor any of their associates were tied to the disappearance, and after their sentencing, it's as if the case simply faded away. For the last decade, there's been pure silence, leading many to wonder if perhaps something went on here behind the scenes. Despite a lack of any solid evidence, Many believe that Paris's murder was written off by prosecutors in exchange for information and plea deals. You really have to try and look at it from the broader perspective. What would federal prosecutors care more about? The disappearance of an Austin club owner or gaining inside information about the activities and movements of a terror organization? I mean, look at how it all turned out. Mike Yassin got the largest sentence out of all the brothers, found guilty of drug trafficking, money laundering, tax evasion, and illegal firearm sales. He's sentenced to 12 and a half years? Doesn't that seem a little light considering the charges? Steve and Hattie get six years apiece, and then they're just deported right back to the Ivory Coast. For a group of people apparently tied to a lot of criminal acts, some of which were captured both on audio and video by an FBI informant, later revealed to be a cousin of the brothers, they sure got off light. I can see why people believe some kind of a deal was cut here, and in the end, the investigation into Paris's disappearance may have been sacrificed in order to try to catch a bigger fish. Still yet, others believe there was never any solid evidence linking any of the Yassines nor their associates to the crime, but it was hoped the trial would reveal more evidence. It didn't. Nearly 22 years have passed since 36-year-old Parish Patel walked out of the metro, climbed into his Lexus SUV, and drove off into the unknown. Despite accusations from law enforcement that Mike Yassin was a person of interest in the case, he's never been charged, and over the course of the past decade, no additional information about Parish 
nor the investigation into his disappearance has ever been released. Sadly, it seems, unless someone comes forward, new evidence is found or Paris is located. This case will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Parish Patel, there honestly aren't a great deal of sources available. Both the Galveston Daily News and KVUE ABC News were helpful putting this episode together. The Austin American Statesman by far had the most extensive coverage, and this episode would not have been possible without their hard work. If you have any information about the disappearance of Parish Patel, please contact the Austin Police Department at 512-974-5250. His case number is 2000-270-0732. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our very amazing Patreon producers. Thank you to Alicia Townsend, Amy Guthrie, Andrew Guarino, Anne Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloan Meyer, Fabulous T.T., Greg, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkowitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fengel, Leslie B., Marla Wright, Melissa Breckeisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Sarah Lyons, Susie the Cutie, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tiffany Nelson, Tom Archer, and Tom Radford. Thank you so much for your amazing support. Without you, this show would not be possible. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit trace-evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. This concludes our look into the 2000 disappearance of 36-year-old Parish Patel. I want to thank you all for listening to this case, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.